All right, good morning. We're going to go ahead. We're in the Gospel of Mark. It's 9 o'clock. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. So we've been going through uh, the Gospel of Mark this quarter, and we've made our way to Mark chapter 4 and about verse 10. Uh, verse 9 is the last verse that we covered last week. We'll go ahead and, of course, summarize the beginning of Mark. Uh, we've talked just a little bit of a summary. Mark is the shortest gospel, 16 chapters. The first eight chapters sort of focus on the miracles of Jesus uh, and establishing him as the Messiah, okay, and all the different um, power he, he uh, shows over death, uh, disease, sickness, demons, okay. And so uh, here today we're going to be able to look at not only, hopefully we get through four and then into five, four is a longer chapter, but uh, hopefully we get into five and see his power over death, either this week, um, next week I think I'm in, I don't think I'm here next week, but um, okay, let's look at Mark chapter four. So we started off uh, in the first nine verses with the parable of the sower. Let's just go ahead and quickly read through those verses to sort of catch back up. Mark chapter four and verse one. And again, he began to teach them by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he, Jesus, taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching. Verse 3, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground, where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But the other seed fell on good ground, and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some thirtyfold some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the parable of the sower, Luke 8, it's in Matthew's account as well. And so in this parable, he says that someone sowed some seed, and it was on four types of soil. Okay, the first one was the wayside. That would be the, maybe the walking paths. Okay, it was uh, matted down. It wasn't very good for soil growth. Then you had the stony ground, where the, the plant couldn't get roots in deep. And then you had the third one, which is among the thorns, and the thorns choked it. And the fourth type of seed was the good ground, okay? And so last week, we read this introductory, the first nine verses, uh, and then class ended. So let's go ahead and pick up here in Mark chapter 4 and verse 10. Mark 4, 10. But when he was alone, this is Jesus, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. So it says the twelve are with him and also those around him. These are likely people who heard his teaching and didn't what? They didn't leave, right? We talked uh, last week, why would Jesus teach in parables? What are some reasons that Jesus may have taught in parables? Okay. Okay, that's right. That's a good point. Ms. Linda said maybe, maybe they're uh, basically looking for people because he knows there are some people who aren't looking for the truth. Uh, and we talked about how when Jesus spoke in parables, it sort of, it would divide the people. There were some people who'd hear this story about, you know, a sower went out and sowed some seed, and he threw some on this path, and some on this stony ground, and some on this good ground, and some on this thorns. And there might be a person that comes and says, wait a minute, this is, this is the Messiah? This is the Savior of Israel? And what's the Savior of Israel doing? The Savior of Israel is telling me about some guy throwing seed in a field, right? And so there are other people who would hear this, and they'd be intrigued by it, and they'd try to understand, okay, what exactly is this man Jesus? What exactly is this teacher saying, okay? And so that's what you have here in verse 10. And so whenever the people who are with him leave, now all of a sudden you have Jesus alone with his disciples, okay, in the 12. Um, verse 11, and he said to them, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables, right? So he's saying, hey, to the people who want to hear the explanation, God's going to explain it. But to those who don't want to hear the explanation, what? This is going to be a parable to them. It's going to be a story. Now look at this next verse. Some of these next verses can be kind of confusing. You know, the word there, mystery, doesn't mean, I said this last week, that when you see the word mystery in the New Testament, um, it's normally a translation of the same word here in Greek, but 
Um, this doesn't mean something you can't understand. It means something that has to be what to be understood? Has to be explained, yeah. So when it talks about you know, the mystery in the New Testament of this, or in Ephesians 3, the mystery, it's something that is explained, is being revealed now. Okay, that's what it means here in verse 11. Okay, so look at Mark 4, 33 and 34 real quick. This is later in this chapter, but just look at Mark 4, 33 and 34. This is something Jesus does constantly. Mark 4, 33. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it, Verse 34, but without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he what? Explained all things to his disciples, right? So it wasn't like there was a certain group of people that understood the parables immediately and others didn't. Jesus had to explain these parables even to the disciples, okay? Look back at Mark chapter 4 and verse 12. This is a continuation of the quote in 4.11, okay? And look at what he says. So that, he's speaking of the people that are outside these parables. Listen to what he says. So that seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. All right? Uh, how do you think some people take this verse? What's, what do you think would be a wrong application of it? There are some people, uh, there are some groups, religious groups, that teach that certain people God didn't pick. And therefore, God didn't choose to give them this miraculous gift of regeneration of their spirit. And they'll say, therefore, they can't even understand the scriptures, right? And whenever you talk with them and say, no, that's, that's not what the Bible says, this is a verse that they'll go to a lot. They go to this verse and they say, look, Jesus said this. There are some people that could see it, but they won't understand it. They won't perceive. And hearing, they won't understand. And why would God not allow them to do that? Because God doesn't want them to turn and their sins be forgiven right? This is a verse that a lot of Calvinists or Reformed theology, they use this verse a lot. And what they try to say is, see, God doesn't want everybody to turn and be saved or, as he or else he would make it so everybody can understand, right? That's not at all what the text is saying, okay? Um, is Jesus trying to intentionally keep people from understanding his word? No. Okay, let's look at why. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, okay? There's a principle of Bible study, which is you always interpret the hard passages in light of what? The easy ones, that's right. Whenever you have a passage like 2 Peter 3.9 that says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, the promise was in verse 7 about God's judgment coming on the world, right, at the, end of the, at the judgment day at the end of the age. It says, uh, God is not slack or slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is long-suffering, patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, right? The reason Peter says in 2 Peter 3 that God hasn't judged the world yet is he's patient and he's waiting for people to what? Repent. And he wants all to repent and none to perish. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 says, God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, right? So God says he wants all men to repent come to a knowledge of the truth, be saved so that they won't perish, right? Those are very easy, clear passages. So when you come to something like this, you have to say, okay, how, how can you reconcile the two so the Bible doesn't contradict, right? The first thing it's important to look at at this passage here is he's quoting from Isaiah, right? Isaiah is an Old Testament what? Prophet. Uh, what was Isaiah's job? It was to go to stubborn, rebellious Israel who was made stubborn and rebellious by God? No. No. Um, Isaiah says, your ears, you've stopped up. Your eyes, you've closed, right? So the people were rebellious because of whose choices? Their choices, right? That's correct. That's right. That's right. That's right. So what you have in Isaiah is a prophet who God sends to a stubborn nation, made stubborn by their own decisions, okay? And so you have here, you have Jesus quoting this, okay? And if you look over, look over at Matthew's account. Sometimes in one gospel account, like Mark's, which is the shortest, you may look at another account and it may have what? More information, all right? Um, sometimes in the scriptures, the entire sermon is not recorded for us, or everything that Jesus said is not recorded, all right? You know, we have an example of this in Acts 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch. It says in Acts 8.35, I believe it is, he preached Christ to him, 
And then they got to water, and he said, hey, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And the eunuch didn't say, well, what, wait a minute. What, or, what do you, Philip didn't say, what are you talking about, water? Obviously, him preaching Christ included more words than we have recorded in the account, right? So go to Matthew chapter 13. This is a parallel account. Matthew 13 gives us a little bit more information. All right, so look at Matthew 13, and let's just start in verse 13. So Matthew 13, 13 says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive. And look at what it says in verse 15. This is additional to Mark's account. The hearts of this people have what? Grown dull, wax gross. It doesn't say they were born dull. It doesn't say that they were from the, from the young child. They've never been able to understand God's word. That's not what it says. It says they've grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have what? Closed lest they should see with their ears and hear with, see with their eyes and hear with their ears, okay? So in Matthew's account, you see that basically, look, this is something that they've done, right? The reason that they didn't understand these parables is not because they literally couldn't understand them if they didn't hang around for Jesus to explain them, right? Jesus is weeding out two different types of people, the type of people that what? Want to learn and the type of people that what? Don't want to learn. They're too busy. They think this stuff about uh, sowing seed in a field is just dumb. This guy's supposed to be the savior of Israel. I came to see him work a miracle. I don't want to hear about these little parables, right? Whereas the people who are truly seeking after Jesus, they're willing to stick around. They're willing to hear the explanation and dig deeper, okay? So Matthew's account gives you a little bit more information. In fact, Paul actually quotes this same idea in uh, Acts 28, Acts 28, 23 through 28, about the people who reject God's message, and he says, we're going to go to the Gentiles. Just like in Acts 13, Paul says the same thing. He says, since you reject the word of God, we're going to go preach to the who? To the Gentiles. Paul didn't say, well, I know you're rejecting it because you could... I know you, I, Paul never said, I know you're rejecting it because you don't have a choice. Paul always said, hey, look, if you reject this, you're accountable, right? You had a choice. Jesus said the same thing in John 5, 34. He says, I say these words that you may be saved... And in John 5.40, he says, but you're not willing to come to me that you can have life, right? So this passage is not, as some people do use it. And sometimes when we go through these Bible classes, and at least for me, I had never heard during the parable of the sower explanation these verses be explained, right? I know, we all know the parable of the sower very well because we hear it a lot, okay? But that, those verses there sometimes are taken uh, out of context. I have more in the notes. Remember, if you want the notes, sign up on the list. I sent the first set of notes out last week. Um, if you did not get them and you signed up on the list, it's probably because I couldn't read your email. I do my best when I enter it in my computer, but sometimes I see handwriting and I'm like, I don't know if that's a zero or an O, and I do my best. But if you signed up and you haven't got the notes, uh, come and find me and, or rewrite your email down and I'll, uh, I'll send them out. Okay. So I've got more passages in there about um, Mark 6.52 says the disciples, the apostles, they hadn't understood a parable because their heart was hardened as well. Okay. So this is something that even followers of God can have, okay, spiritual people. All right, so overall summary, this is something that was to rebellious uh, Israel because they chose to be rebellious, and here you have Jesus saying that prophecy of them is the same thing of you all, okay? It's fulfilled in you, for certain people who reject God's word. Look at Mark 4.13 now. Let's go back to Mark. Mark 4.13, all right. He said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? And he's going to explain, right? So even the disciples and the people following him, they're with him, and they don't what? They don't understand, okay? So if, if this is the first time maybe you've ever heard this parable and you don't understand it, guess what? You're in good company because the apostles of Jesus didn't understand it. And so Jesus now says, this mystery, I'm going to un un unveil it to you. I'm going to unravel it to you. Mark 4, 14, the sower sows the word. Okay, uh, Luke 8, 11 says the seed is the word of God. So this parable, the seed that is being sown, parallels the word of God. Mark 4, 15. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Uh, Luke 8, 12 says uh, that he takes away the word lest they should, what? Believe and be saved. Right? Luke 8, 12 says that. So the Bible throughout the New Testament tells us that the power is in the what? The Word. Okay? The power is in the Word, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. I have some other cross-references. Uh, James 1, 18. Of his own will he brought us forth by the Word of truth, 
1 Peter 1, 23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God. Um, so I have all those references in the notes uh, as well. All right. Mark uh, 4, 16. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground. When they hear the word, immediately they receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves and endure only for a time. A little time is implied. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they what? They stumble. So what's this describing? Somebody who hears the word, they believe it, they're saved, they're converted, and they follow for what? Short period of time, right? And it describes them as that rocky soil, because if you've ever tried to plant something on rocky soil, what? It'll sprout, it'll put down roots, and those roots what? They hit the rock. They don't have anywhere to go to get moisture, okay? And so what will happen to them? Eventually they'll die. And so he says some people who are followers of God, that happens to them. Maybe they hear the word and they just get really excited and they believe it and they start following and then what happens? Yeah, here it says tribulation, okay, suffering, or persecution arises for the word's sake. So something comes into their life that they have to choose between who? Between God and some sort of suffering, okay? The book of Hebrews, you had people who converted to, to Christianity and then persecution came, all right? It was in the form of, hey, you've left Judaism, why weren't you at Sabbath, you know, why weren't you at synagogue, uh, you know, why aren't you circumcising, whatever it was, they start persecuting these people, and then some of them do what? They go back, all right? Today, the application for us is, you might have a new convert, I can think of lots of new converts who were converted, they saw the truth, they obeyed it, they were baptized, and then what happened? They started encountering opposition from family, you know, maybe who basically didn't, it wasn't so uh, energetic about their newfound conversion, and some of those people have left, Okay. So that's what the second soil is here. Look at the third one, verse 18. That's correct. That's correct. Correct. Christians do, that's right. Christians do have a responsibility for us ourselves to grow. That's correct. Verse 18. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones that hear the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. All right? Now this one I think is, I've said this before in different lessons, I think this one is the most dangerous one for the people in this room, right? Uh, why is this one dangerous? That's right. There's so much stuff that keeps you, doesn't kill you. Notice it doesn't say that the thorns kill this plant, right? But they keep it from becoming what? Fruitful. Uh, John 15, if you want to read that or put that in your notes. John 15, Jesus talks about he's the vine and we're the branches. And the one that bears fruit, he prunes so it can bear more fruit. But then you have the branches that don't bear fruit. And what does it say God does? He just leaves them there because, you know. He cuts them off, right? Um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, it talks about growing in the Christian graces. Uh, and it says, if you do these things, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge. I can't remember the rest of them offhand. But uh, it says, if you do these things, you'll never stumble, and you won't be unfruitful, right? So as Christians, we need to grow so that we're not unfruitful. And I think this third soil um, is dangerous for all of us. I'm not saying that I'm exempt to that, right? Uh, there's been many times in my life, I'd say most of my 20s, where, you know, I was attending worship, right? But would I say that I had a lot of fruit in my life? I, probably not, because I was engulfed with all these other things, you know? Uh, there are things that are not sinful that you can enjoy that are great and fun and fine, but if they become an idol to you and you put them above God, then those are things that are, can kind of be like thorns in this that will choke out, choke out your ability to produce fruit as a Christian. All right, look at Mark uh, 4.20. But these, the fourth soil, are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100. All right, so what kind of soil are you? All right, you can keep that to yourself. I don't want anybody to blurt out, all right? The question that we should only look at application, ask ourselves, 
I mean, that's, that's why we study the scriptures, right? To see the applications Jesus made to them and then say, how can we apply that to our life? Okay, so each one of us, myself included, have to ask ourselves, what kind of soil are you, right? You're probably not the first soil unless someone drug you here and you don't want to be here, okay? Um, are you the second soil? Maybe you're, maybe you're a new convert, all right? Maybe you're the one that just received the word and you believe it. Um, put down roots, right? You get to determine what type of soil you are. And this is not like something you can't change, okay? You can change the Bible over and over. Gives us commands like Romans 12.1, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You do that through God's word, right? So make sure that you put down your roots. Um, are you the one that's heard it? Don't let the devil snatch it out of your heart. If you're here for the first time and someone drug you here, hear the word, don't let the devil snatch it out of your heart and believe, okay? Um, if you're the second soil, uh, the word has taken root. Uh, don't let your roots be shallow. Okay, spend time in God's word. Build deeper root systems so that you don't fall away. Um, those of us in the room, um, don't let something good take over God as your first priority. Right? If you love sports, that's great. Right? You can reach a lot of people. There, there's a lot of people you'll reach in your interactions in your life that nobody else will. Right? If you're an athlete, there's people on your team that you can be an influence on that maybe you'll be the only Christian they ever play with, right? Let them see your example. If you're a coworker, right? I'm not saying everybody quit their jobs and everybody just, you know, become a full-time preacher, right? There's people you'll interact in your jobs that Robert will never get to meet unless you what? Speak to them, you're a good example, and maybe they'll come here and maybe Robert will get to meet them. But it won't be because Robert is a good example to them, right? It'll be because you are, okay? So don't let the cares of the world take over the place that God should have at the top. But I'm also not saying that you can't enjoy anything in this world, right? Uh, God made things for us to enjoy, right, in his creation. And then the, first, the fourth one, uh, the good soil in God's eyes that bears uh, more fruit. Okay, look at Mark 4.21. Mark 4.21. Also, Jesus, he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? What's the, what's the idea here? He's saying, hey, you should, what? It's that little song, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This is one of the first songs Eric learned, don't let Satan, and Eric would go, Phew. okay? Don't let Satan but put it out. That's what Jesus is saying here, okay? There is nothing hid in Mark 4.22 which will not be revealed, nor has anything be kept secret that it would not come to light. Verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus is saying, hey, these things I'm teaching, you're not supposed to what? Keep them hidden, okay? The meanings will be made clear to those people who want to hear and understand, all right? So he says, if anyone has ears, let him hear, and you can obey and you can follow. So Jesus wants people who hear something and they might not understand it, and they dig in deeper, okay? Look at Mark 4, 24. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear with the same measure you use it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. All right? This is a principle uh, throughout the Bible. You see not only this idea of what you hear, but also the things that are given to you. Right? So God will give you something, whether it's financial blessing or it's a word or whatever, and are you responsible for how you use it? Yes. And there are passages over and over that say the same thing. Now it's speaking in this context of hearing. So it's saying you hear God's word, and you have a decision to what? Keep hearing it. You can accept it, you can follow, you can try to hear more, or you can reject it, right? And if you accept it and you follow and you learn more, what's ultimately going to happen? You're going to keep learning, all right? It's going to be sort of exponential the way you grow spiritually. Whereas if you reject it, what's going to happen? Spiritually, you're going to die, you know? Spiritually, you're going to die. So be careful how you hear God's message. Verse 25, whoever has, to him more will be given. But to whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So in, in context, be careful what you do when you hear God's message, okay? If you hear God's message, realize that if you don't obey it, what's it going to do? If you hear the truth over and over, I, I know of people in, in my life who've sat in a pew for 60 years, and they come every Sunday, and they've heard God's word every single week, and they've done what? They haven't obeyed it. They might come because somebody else wants them to come. They might not really want to be there. But eventually, those people sitting there for 40, 50, 60 years, and they've heard, they probably know factually every single thing the Bible says. But if they haven't obeyed it, what's it going to do? Nothing. It's going to, see, it's going to harden their heart, yeah. Imagine somebody who sat in a pew, you know, well, it's an imaginary person that sat back here for 30 years, and he's heard every single thing that Robert or the elders or 
he was here from when BJ and you know, Wade and all the other guys were preachers, right? And Don was here, and he's heard every single thing they've taught, and he's never obeyed it. Are you going to have a chance at teaching him something that he doesn't know? Probably not if he's been here, but his heart has probably been hardened by God's word. So the overall thing is just be careful when you hear God's word, respond to it, be obedient as soon as you hear it. Don't, don't put it off and wait. Okay, look at um, the... That's true, that's true. That's very true. All right, so the next two parables here in Mark, verse 26, these next two parables are only found, I believe, in Mark's account, right? If I overlooked it and you know about it, let me know. Um, they're not really explained in the text, okay? So we just got to, what is the principle we put with the parable of the sower? God wants people who what? Hear a parable and do what? They dig in. Right? They dig in, they want to know what does this mean. They try to understand the explanation, all right? So it's interesting to me the next two parables in Mark aren't explained. Um, are we going to be the kind of people who just walk away and say, well, I, I don't really, I don't have time for it, right? What does this mean? I don't know. Or are you going to be the kind of person that says, well, let's think about this. What are some Bible principles we learn elsewhere? What could he possibly mean by this, all right? So look at Mark 4.26. He said to them, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed would spout and grow, and he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head, but when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. All right, so what's this mean? Right, let's think about what he says first of all. Okay. The seed is scattered. The seed what? The Word of God, what Luke 8, 11, and the earlier. So the seed is scattered. The seed grows, even if we might not quite understand what? Okay. Miss Linda said that BJ said that he preached a sermon somewhere, and 10 years later, someone came up to him and said that that sermon that he preached had sort of got it going, and that seed grew into her converting 10 years later, right? If you ask BJ the next day, of course, BJ would probably say, you know, BJ, was your meeting a success? He'd probably say, absolutely, because he preached the word, right? But some people would say, well, how many conversions were there? How many restorations did you have? I hear people, uh, those are great things, don't get me wrong, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying, but... Sometimes you'll hear a meeting and they'll say, well, you know, how many restorations did you have or how many conversions? And you say, well, none. Oh, well, that doesn't mean it was a failure, right? You're preaching God's word and God's word is one that does the work. Sometimes you might not see it immediately. It's just like when we planted a garden. I planted seeds and I'd go out there and look at them the first couple of days and, I, well, nothing's happening. And then you kind of forget about it and I'd go on a work trip. I'd come back two weeks later and what? There's all kinds of plants. I'm like, when did that happen? You know, I, I remember thinking if I would sit out here and watch it, I wonder if the time lapse, you know? No. Sometimes stuff grows and you don't understand, you know, you don't see it, okay? Um, that's exactly right. You know, some of the verses I have written in my Bible, I have 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6. One plants, another waters, and God continually gives the increase, all right? I have John four thirty five. the fields are white for harvest. This is said right after Jesus meets a Samaritan woman and she goes into the city and tells the people, I met a man who, knew, who told me everything about me ever. He knew everything about me, right? And so then Jesus says to the disciples, the fields are white for harvest. I wonder if he's talking to the disciples. I don't know if he's looking up and seeing all the people from Samaria coming out to hear him preach. And he tells the disciples, hey, the fields are white unto harvest, right? Uh, John 4.35. I have James 5.7. It says, be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it's received, the early and the latter rain. So he talks here about the coming of the Lord and see how the farmer waits for the fruit, waiting patiently until it receives the rain, until it grows. So is this parable saying, hey, look, plant the seed, which would be fit the context of the parable of the sower. Let it grow. You might not understand how it's going to grow, but it's going to grow. And then you're waiting until what? It matures until the Lord comes back and the Lord's patient because he's waiting for the fruit to grow like James 5. Maybe, okay? But as you read the New Testament, um, sometimes you might find a parable like this and then you say, okay, what are some passages that, that might give me some more information, some insight? That's great. Okay, look at verse 30. This is another parable. Then he said, 
What shall we liken? To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, it is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. It's the smallest seed in Palestine. Some people say, well, you know what? Over in this other part of the world, you know, there's a smaller seed than the mustard seed. All right, well, the Bible, believe it or not, uses the Greek word for earth. Sometimes talk about the Palestine region or the Roman world. In fact, in Luke uh, 2.1, it says they took a census of the whole world, all right? I don't think Rome came over to South America and was taking a census there, okay? So sometimes people will say, oh, well, in English, there's a Bible contradiction. Well, the New Testament was written in what language? Greek, okay? And so when you look at what a word means, try not to, make a, try not to necessarily say there's a contradiction in English, because if you go look at that Greek word, it might mean what? It might, in some contexts, it's called a semantic range. Some words in English, it's the same thing. I threw a ball, I had a ball. Um, what's another one? Went to a ball, right? I had a ball, I had a great time. I went to a ball, like Cinderella, or I threw a ball, okay? It's called semantic range. Same thing in Greek. Sometimes you have one word that means world, but depending on the context, it can mean the entire world. It can mean a localized region like the Roman world, okay? So he says here, it is like a mustard seed, it's smaller than all the seeds on the earth. All right. It grows into a massive tree if you look at what the mustard seed actually does. Okay. So when it is sown, verse 32, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. Okay. So the kingdom of God is like this tiny little seed that what? Grows into a great big tree. All right. What do you think? What's the application? What do you think? What could be the application? Church grew, spread all over the world like that. Okay? Okay? I mean, I think about, you know, you have this tiny little baby born in Bethlehem that turns into who? Grows into a man, the Messiah, Jesus, and he goes out and preaches some words, and he dies, and he has 12 disciples that whenever they go out and preach the gospel at what? 3,000, Acts 2, 5,000, multitudes of congregations spreads across the entire world in the first century. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, no, Colossians 1, 6 and 1, 23 or something, that the gospel had gone to the whole world in the first century. Oh, that's impossible. No, it's not. That's how fast the gospel can spread, okay? And so you have this tiny little seed that grows into what? Something massive, okay? All right. Mark four thirty three. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. All right. Did Jesus ever, this verse says, he spoke par- in all things he spoke parables to them, right? There's tons of times where Jesus spoke what? Clearly, directly. You know, the woman at the well in John 4, you know, he said, where's your husband? She said, well, I don't have a husband. He's like, yeah, I know. You've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. He spoke clearly at times, right? What this is saying is that Jesus spoke in parables what? A lot. A lot, okay? A lot. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you, you see throughout the Gospels, there were a lot of people coming to check Jesus out for the wrong reasons, all right? So Jesus spoke in parables. He taught a lot in parables, okay? Uh, look at Mark four thirty five. On the same day when the evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and the other little boats were also with him. So there, it seems like they're in a larger boat, and they have other smaller boats with them. All right, so this envoy, okay? Verse uh, 37, Mark 4, 37. And a great windstorm arose. That great is mega in Greek, so we're going to mega. So a mega windstorm arose, and the the waves beat into the boat so that it was already what? Filling. So you have this mega storm, and the boat is filling with what? Water. And you're in the middle of a, a small sea, okay, a small ocean, right? Um, and you know, these, the disciples of Jesus, they never had been on water, right? They were fishermen. Yeah, that's tongue in cheek. Of course they'd been on the water. They were fishermen. They were professional fishermen. So these are not guys who get on a little boat out here in a lake, and they're like, oh, I haven't been on a boat before. I'm scared. Now, these are guys who made their living in a boat. So this is a big storm, uh, and they're terrified, okay? And look at what happens. Verse 38, but Jesus, he, was in the stern asleep on a what? Asleep on a pillow. (laughs) 
I don't know if this is just showing the humanity of Jesus. Hey, he's exhausted. He needs sleep. Uh, I don't know if it's just showing how calm and collected he was that, you know, I know sometimes I'm so tired I get on an airplane and I am out. I mean, I, I've fallen asleep before during boarding and woken up in the next city and didn't even know we'd taken off the ground before. So I don't know if it's something like that where he's just so tired or what. Um, but he is in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? So the disciples wake up Jesus, and they say, you know, Jesus, we're scared, okay? Um, and he says, Jesus, Jesus is asleep, and they say, Jesus, do you not care that we're about to die? And you say, well, they're being dramatic. I mean, they're on a sea with what? A giant storm with waves big enough that they're filling the boat, that a boat apparently is big enough that Jesus can sleep on the stern, right? It's a mega storm. It's a big storm, Okay. Verse 39, then he arose and what? Rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm, a mega calm. So from a mega storm to a mega calm, all because Jesus what says? Cut it out. Stop it. Okay. Um, I was leaving the grocery store in, her, in uh, Olive Branch coming home from work the other day. And as I was coming out the door, it was just like a downpour. And I was like, yeah, I'm not walking out in this. So I waited for a few minutes. And I thought about this. I thought about, imagine if some person just walked out and said, peace be still. And the storm just immediately was. Or imagine if there's like a tornado raging, one of these big thunderstorms, and someone just speaks a word and it just calms, right? What would that make you think? Look at what it says to them, right? Look at verse uh, Mark 440. He said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? <laughs> um, Jesus got right to the point sometimes, didn't he? He says, why are you guys afraid? I'm with you. You're afraid that this giant storm... I can kind of relate to the disciples here, right? If Jesus is asleep, I mean, you know that he can work miracles, but you also think, is this a miracle he's going to work right here? Okay. Why, why is it that you are so fearful? How is it you have no faith? Have, and I guess what he's getting at is Jesus, they've been with him, and Jesus had done what already? Miracles. He's worked miracles. And it's... He didn't have to be there to work the miracles. That's right. He was Yeah. And there's, there's still, you know, a lot of times they're still figuring this thing out. They're like, well, I know Jesus can work miracles, but he's asleep. Is he even aware of this? Maybe they don't know that he's omniscient yet, okay? And so what you have here is you have Jesus saying, how is it you have no faith? Have you... Have you not seen the miracles that I've been doing? Where, where have you been? Do you not realize who I am yet? And I think they're starting to realize. Look at Mark 4.41. They feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So who is this man? All right. It's one thing when you heal a leper. Okay, that's a miracle. That's amazing. But when you not only show that you have power over disease, but you can calm what? You have power over creation. Um, something that was chaotic in the first century, okay? Like a big, massive storm on a sea, and Jesus just calms it. Um, I don't know if it brought to storm, uh, brought to mind some of the Old Testament passages. Psalm 107, 29 said, He calms the storm so that its waves are still, okay? Psalm 89, 9, You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. And Psalm 65, 7, You who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves... Psalm 65, 7. Those are all in the notes, if you have the notes. So, I mean, I don't know if that came to their mind. Uh, they knew the Old Testament much, I would, get, I would assume they knew it much better than I did, because it's like, well, how we know the New Testament, they grew up studying the Old Testament over and over, right? And so we've already seen so far in the first four chapters, Jesus has power over creation, okay? Storms here. The human body, Mark 3, he healed the withered hand. Mark 2, he healed the disease, leprosy, and Peter, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. And then in Mark 1, he's cast out demons. Now in chapter 5, we'll pick up in, I guess, maybe two weeks or whenever I'm here next, um, Jesus is going to show he has power over the ultimate enemy, which is death. Okay? Jesus is going to heal and raise somebody who has died. So as we close, ask yourself, ask yourself the Mark 4.41 question. Who can this man be? Who is this man that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who's the man that can command demons and they obey him? Who can cure sickness, leprosy? All these different, who is Jesus? Who is he to you? Is he a good moral teacher? Or is he the son of God? You've got to make that decision for yourself. You have to determine what type of soil you're going to be. Uh, thanks for your attention. Um, sign up list in the back, and we'll pick up next Sunday that I'm here. Thank you.